So exponential functions are different from linear functions because when we graph them, they curve because exponential functions, as it sounds like, involves an exponent in it. And instead of the X being a part of the base of the equation, the X is now repre is, is representing the exponential value on the equation. And the way that they're set up is f of x, so it's still a function notation saying y is the result of the x value, and then it has a, b to the x, where a represents our initial value. How much we're starting with, and then how much we're either going to expand and grow or reduce and decay from that starting value. And we know how much we are increasing or decaying by, by looking at the B value, which is our growth factor, okay? So this is the number we're using to multiply with. And this value is determined from two other values. It comes from one, and the value of the rate being added to the one. And this one is representing, this here is a percent. So how much the percent that is remaining or how much is it's increasing by or how much, uh, yeah, just how much of a substance we have every time we calculate it. And so this one is representing 100% of that initial value. And then we're either increasing from there or um, if the rate happens to be decay, then we're decreasing this value, okay? Uh, and then the X is our input, just like before with the linear functions, but now it's generally representing time. It's representing how many times we need to be calculating this growth or decay to find out our N quantities from whatever we started with, okay? Um, and so if we are graphing this, some things that we know um, has to do with uh, the A is represents our, um, it, on a graph, this would be our y-intercept, okay? And we know that a y-intercept involves x for zero, and then whatever that is for A. So this gets into the, the rules of exponents. An exponent of zero does not mean I don't have any. An exponent of zero, so say I have b to the zero power, okay? b to the zero power means b divided by itself, b over b. And anything divided by itself is a one. So b's value turns into a one. And when I multiply anything by a one, I get that anything. So that's why our initial values also would be our y-intercept on our graph, just if we were graphing it. Okay, uh, now we want to examine the b value and what it means. How do I know if I have growth or decay? Well, if I said that I have a, a growth rate of 20%, I need to convert that 20% into its decimal equivalent and plug it into this B equation. B equals one plus 20%. So when I add those together, I get B equals 1.2. So my growth rate is 20%, but my growth factor is basically, or I guess my growth rate is 0.2. My growth factor is 1.2, which is saying I'm keeping the 100% of the initial value, and then I'm expanding it by another 20% from that point. Now, what if I had a decay rate? What if maybe my object was decaying at a rate of 10% each time it was calculated, okay? Well, a decay, a loss, would be a negative value, right? So if we plug that again into the B, we have a one, and then we have a minus 0.1, because 10% as a decimal is 0.1. So if I have one and I take away a 10th, it means I have nine tenths remaining. So this indicates decay because it is less than one, which means we don't have 100% of that initial value every time we calculate it. So we know that if our B value 
is in between zero and one, we have decay. Okay, and this is why. Then if B is greater than one, we have growth because we're able to keep our initial value percent and add to it. Okay, so that gives us some other ideas. Also on a graph, looking at our B value, we can also know whether our curve, the curve of our line, is going to be steep or fairly shallow. And we know that by how far away from one the B value is. So if I have, we'll say B equals 1.1, um, or we can just have, uh, we'll just do, if I have 1.1 X, if I have point. 8x if I have um, 1.7x and 0.3x, okay? So I know that this is growth because it's more than one. And I look at, in order to find out what the growth rate is, I subtract one from this value because B comes from one plus the rate, so if I take the one away, it lets me know what my rate is and it's a 10% growth, okay? So 10% and it's a positive, so I'll just leave it there. Here I have 0.8. Well, because I'm less than, if I plug this into an equation, 0.8 equals one plus the rate and I have to solve for what the rate is. If I take one away, well, what's the difference between eight tenths and one? It's two tenths. And then which was a bigger value? The negative was bigger. So it's a negative two tenths, which as a percent is negative 20%. We, there was a 20% loss, okay? Here, to find out the growth rate, I have seven tenths more than over the 100%. So that means I have a 70% growth. And 0.3 means that uh, to go from one hole down to only, say, 30 cents, it means we lost 70 cents, which means we lost 70% of that item. Okay? So this gives us an idea of, as we see, the closer to one we are, the less the growth or decay is. The further away from one hole that we are, the greater the rate of growth or decay. And so this can help us determine certain lines on a graph if we were looking at them, okay? Okay, so if I just have this graph here, wherever these would cut through, I'll just pop a, um, well, we're, we're all going to assume that they, they all have the same A value, initial value uh, of one. So we'll go with one. So they're all going to cross here. And this one is saying it's only growing at about 10%. So it's not a very steep growth. It'd be about there. This one, on the other hand, this growth is saying it's every time it's calculated, it increases 70%. So it's also going to hit here, but then it's going to go up really steep. So because this value is further away from one hole, this is a steeper positive curve than just the 10% growth curve. Now, if we look at the, the decays, 20% is not that far away from or 0.8 is not that far away from a hole. So it's not a terribly steep decline, it's going to be a greater curve than this 10% is, um, but we'll say it's going to be about here. And so the negative, the decay lines start up higher over here, and then they go down as you move across. On the other hand, this negative 70 is going to be way up here and reducing. We're going to pretend it all went through the same um, Y intercept. So the steeper the curve, the bigger the variance from the one hole or 100% B value that we have. 
So this kind of just helps us be able to chart graphs and understand which line might be represented by certain values. So for exponential functions, it's all about solving for the exponent, the x value um, to let us know how many times a base is being calculated to find this other value. And the, the rule is, if we have, it's a to the m equals a to the n. If we have some base to an exponent, and we have another, and we have that exact same base on the other side of the equal sign, it means those exponents have to equal each other because the bases equal each other. So once we get two bases being the same number, we can make their their exponents equal each other, which is going to let us solve for one of the unknowns. So if I start with 5x equaling 125, I do not have the same base. So I can't currently solve for x. What I need to do is go over to the 125 and break it down to a base of 5 and figuring out, well, how many 5s got multiplied together to make 125? So I just start dividing out 5. If I take 5 out of 125, I get 25. If I divide 5 out of 25, I get 5. And now I'm done. So I now have 5x equaling, if I take this base, I have a base of 5. And how many times do I have it? I have a 3. So now that I have this, now that my bases are the same or my a's are the same, I can basically ignore them. They don't hold any sway. Now I just look at my exponents and they have to equal each other. So x equals three. And if I plug that in, five to the third power, is it 125? Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, if we have 16x, All right, so 16x equaling 256. Now, generally, a larger base like this is not going to work. We want our bases to be prime factors, unless it's a base of 10. Um, because oftentimes, if I took 16 and I multiplied it by 16, let's see what we would get. 16 times 16. Oh! Well, that actually kind of worked out, that, that one worked out okay. Um, all right, well, that was handy. So you do double check, can I multiply this number by itself to equal that? If not, then I would need to break both sides down further. I just did 16 times 16. If I divide 16 out of uh, 256, guess what, it's 16. So that worked out easier than I had expected it to. This is now a base of 16 squared equaling 16 to the x. Because my bases are the same, my exponents equal each other. So x equals 2. That, that worked out nicer than I thought. OK, I bet we're not going to be so lucky on the next one. Oh, OK, so the next thing is sometimes we are given numbers in fraction form. We can't solve for an exponent when it's on a fraction. So we have this lovely little trick that we can apply to be able to make it a whole number. I have one half to the n equaling 16. Well, I need, instead of a half, I need to be able to flip that and have a two. This is where a negative exponent comes into play. When we had three squared, Three times three is nine. Three to the first power is just three because the exponent is saying how many times that number is multiplied by itself. The three just exists one time, so it means I have three. Each time I'm moving down, I'm actually dividing three off of it, and that's where we get this, this zero. Um, and that why three to the zero power means three divided by three, which is one. No matter what the number is, zero power means I turn the answer into one. Then we can have a negative value on our exponent. This does not mean that I have a negative number. It means I have the reciprocal of this. 
So instead of having three as a whole number, I have one third. So I flip it to get the negative off the exponent. If I have three to the negative two to get the negative off of the exponent, I have to flip it so that it becomes one and three to the second power. And then I evaluate what three to the second power is. It's one ninth and so on and so forth. So I need to be able to flip the one half into a whole number. So to do that, I just put a negative onto its exponent. So now I have two to the negative n equaling 16. All right. So do I have the same base? What do I need to do to the 16? Do the prime factorization. Yeah, I'm going to uh, take it down to its prime factorization. So I know it has, if I have a base of two over here, I want to have a base of two over here. So I'm just going to divide out two and see what I get. All right, two, eight divided by two leaves me a four. Four divided by two leaves me a two and two. So I have four twos here. So two to the fourth power is equal to two to the negative n. Because my bases are the same, it means my exponents equal each other. If I have negative n equals 4, this is not my final answer. Why not? What is wrong with negative n equals 4? You can't have the negative on the exponent or on the variable. You can't have no, it on no. the variable. You're right. So how do we get it off of the variable? Um. Put it in the parentheses and put the negative outside of it and flip the signs. Beautiful. Yes, you make the inverse. You wrap up the entire equation in parentheses, put a negative in front, and then you distribute the negative. Negative times positive becomes a negative four. And now the negative is off of the n and on the four. So n equals negative four. Okay, if we have um, 4x equals 1 16th. What should I maybe do so I'm not working with a fraction? Well, let me flip this so I don't have a fraction. I just got to put a negative sign on it. So instead of having 1 16th, I can go 4x equals 16 to the negative 1. So just because I have it once, that's my exponent, and I put a negative on it to show that it is the reciprocal of 16. So now I need a like base. I have a four over here. Let's see if I can get a four over here. If I divide a four out, does it go out evenly? Yes, it does. Two of them. So four to the X equals four to the negative two, because I have two of them and we keep that negative on there. Because technically what we have, I'll show you this, is four to the four squared with a negative on that revised value. When I have an exponent on an exponent, these two values multiply together. So two times a negative one is a negative two. So if I have four X equals four to the negative two, it means X equals negative two. All right. Um, okay, so then we might have a few more numbers involved. And that's okay. I have three to five x plus thirty three equals nineteen zero eight. Here's my exponential function. Here's my initial value, my growth factor. 
my exponent some extra amount and this. So if I was doing a regular equation that we've been dealing with before, and I need to be solving for my variable, what is the first thing that I need to get rid of? The parentheses well, the exponent. Well, we want to deal with this last because this parentheses is here to show multiplication. And we're basically kind of working the furthest away from the variable we have, working our way closest. So we do have this whole thing, but we have this outside of it. So this is the furthest thing away from our X. So it's what we want to get rid of first. We always add or subtract on both sides before we worry about any multiplication or division. So we got to take away our 33. It's five, eight, seven, eight, one. Okay. So we have three times five to the X power equaling 1875. Now the X is on the five. So those need to stay together. What is closest to it that we need to get rid of? Three. The three. And what do we need to do with that three to get it off of there? Divide it out of. We're going to divide both sides by it, you bet, because it's originally saying multiply here. So we have to divide it out. So if I take 1875, 875 divided by 3, I get 600. So 5x equals 625. Well, I have a base of 5, I need a base of 5 over here. So tell me what this breaks down to as a base of five, five to the what power? it five um i got fourth i got four as well okay so because uh, if i take out five i have 125 if i take five out of that i have 25 and if i take five out of that i have two five so i got a total of, of four fives so five to the x equals five to the fourth. And if you weren't sure, you could double check that by in your calculator, typing in five to the fifth power and seeing if, if that equals it or seeing if it was too much, okay? So what is our x value for this situation? Four. It's gonna be four. So if we were solving this, we'd plug in five to the fourth power to get um, 625. Multiply that by three, then add 33 to get the 1908. Okay. Three times eight to the X plus 22 equals 70. I'm not expecting this to be very big, but let's see. Okay, so where do we start? What do we clear off first? We have to um, take away 22 from both sides. We take 22 away from both sides. Leaving us with 48. So three times eight to the X power equals 48. Now, what's our next step? So you divide both sides by three? Yeah, we got to divide both sides by three to be able to have the 8x equals 16. 16. Now, 
Looking at powers, can I go eight? So eight to the first power is eight. Eight to the second power is 64, which is way bigger than that. So am I going to be keeping an eight or do I need to make, I need to break it into a smaller base, right? Because I don't have a power I can raise this to that makes 16 as it stands. So what number should we break eight and 16 down to? Two. A two, you bet. When I divide a two out, I get four and two and two. So this becomes two to the third times to the X power, which just means because we have an exponent on an exponent, I have, I'll put it over here, two to the three X. And here, when I divide a two out, I get two to the fourth. All right, because my bases are the same, I now need my exponents to equal each other. Those go away. 3x equals 4. How do I solve for x? Divide it by 3. Divide both sides by 3. You got it. So x equals 4 thirds. We can have a fraction as an exponent. And that is, ooh, okay, let's do 12 together as well. Okay, and I have eight to the three X plus one power equaling 16 to the two X minus three power, okay. I need my bases the same. What did we say eight was a good base of? We just converted it. What was it worth? Two to the third power. So two to the third power to the three X plus one power equals, and we did 16. 16 is two to the what? Two to the fourth power. Two to the fourth power, and it gets multiplied by, or and then to the two x minus three power. What did I say we do to exponents and exponents? Uh, multiply them. We multiply them together. Yeah. So we are going to distribute that three and the four. So three times a three X. Nine X. Nine X plus three and four X minus 12. All right, these two have to equal each other. Oh, I, ah, ha, 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 I messed up. Caught myself though. All right, eight X minus 12. How do I solve for X? on two sides. I can't have that. You do like a normal um, equation. So eliminate one side of the X. Yeah. yeah, by um, subtract. Yeah, I'm uh, You can subtract eight from the nine. If we subtract the eight off of both sides, that still allows me to have a positive X. So X plus three equals negative 12. And what do I do with the three? You subtract three both sides. Subtract three from both sides so that I get an X equals negative 15. And that was one of my options in the equation. I got my green check mark. I have a question. Okay. Okay, so we did the negative eight X. So we took negative eight X from one side and moved it to the other. And then we took the 
negative three from that side and moved it to the other side. I don't understand why we did from both sides. Okay, so we needed all of the X's on one side and all of the numbers on the other. So I, when we <gasps> have here, I took away the three from both sides so that now I only have an X on this side and all my numbers are on the other. Okay, I didn't think about it being like the X's with the constants. I didn't, I didn't think about that. Okay. Thank you. you it's always, glad it's always the easy stuff. Like, yeah. Hey, I'm glad that we could clarify that. So it's all good. Okay. So looking at growth versus decay, uh, task two it is giving us some story problems and we're having to kind of dissect the information and do some calculations on it. Um, and so um, in North Dakota, so North Dakota has recently had the fastest growing population out of all 50 states. On January 1st, 2013, the population of North Dakota was 700,000 people. North Dakota's population has been growing by 5% each year. Express North Dakota's population, N, in terms of years since 2013, so T, and use data from your state if applicable. No, not going to be applicable. So basically, we need to take these details and start plugging them into our equation. So for this, it's going ahead and saying that N is representing the number of people after T years. So the T, our X is actually going to be a T. What was our starting point? What was the starting population it gave us? 700,000. 700,000. So the number of people we have is 700,000 because it's our starting point, it's our initial value, then what is happening from this point? It's happening to the population. It increases by 5% per year. It increases by 5% each year. So that means we need to find our B value. If B is determined by taking one and adding the rate of growth to it, well, we need the rate of growth to be a decimal value. That would be 0 0.05. So my growth rate or my growth factor is 1.05. 1.05. And after T years. So this is our equation that we are going to use to calculate the population in North Dakota after 2013. So we need to figure out what our T is. What's our time going to be? How long has it been since 2013? From now or from question three? Because question three gives us a year. Oh, ah, you're right. You're right. Okay, that makes sense. I didn't, I haven't done this one in a while. Okay, so anyways, there's our baseline equation. So it asks, what was your initial value? And we picked 700,000. What was our growth factor? Not the rate. So our growth factor was 1.05 because our rate was 0 0.05. And so now, okay, this makes sense. So what was the population in 2019? So how many years has it been from 2013 to 2019? Six years, so the T is a six. T is a six, so it wants us to find N of six is 700,000 times 1.05 to the sixth power. So when we calculate though these equations, where do we start? What's the first thing we need to calculate? You're gonna need a scientific calculator. Candy crush off of my phone. Okay, if you happen to have a calculator on your phone, generally, if you turn it to a side, it will turn into a scientific calculator. 
All right, where are we starting here? PEMDAS says what? Uh, we have two operations, multiplication and an exponent. PEMDAS says we solve what first? The exponent. Exponent first. So what you're going to do to calculate the exponent value is you could do the long way, saying 1.5, 1 1.05 times 1.05 times 1.05 times 1.05 times 1.05. Or you just go 1.05, hit the X to the Y button. So it's a big X, little Y up in the air, like it, the Y is the exponent, and then a six. I think somebody might have said that they had a Y to the X, but generally it should be X to the Y. Okay, and so when we type in 1.05 x to the y, 6, we get, you get the 1.34009564026.25? Yes. Okay, fantastic. I sometimes like to double calculate just in case I did something wrong. I want to make sure that my numbers work out both times. Okay, so we keep this entire value. We do not uh, we do not round it, cut anything off. We need this whole sucker. Okay. Um 1.34009564026.25. And what are we going to do with that enormous number or that mini digit number? We got to multiply it. So we have to multiply it by our initial value. So multiply times 700,000. Double check. Be careful about your number of zeros. And what did we get? We cannot have, also, we cannot have a partial human. It's all or nothing. So what's our population in six years? 938,066. 938,066 people. And just a little side note, this, because we know that this represents a percent, one representing the initial value, 100%, this 34 lets me know that the population grew 34% in those six years. So just a little extra tidbit of information of what that all contributed to. So this is the population, okay? So this was expressing growth. Do we have any questions on that? Okay. So when solving, we always start with evaluating the exponent and then whatever we get from that, we then multiply it by our initial value. All right, now we have an air freshener. An air freshener starts with 30 grams of fluid and the fluid amount decreases by 12% each day. That means starts off with 30, it loses 12%. Whatever that remaining value is, then it loses 12% of that. Whatever's left over, it loses 12% of that. It's not a fixed linear rate of a 12% fixed loss each time, it's 12% of whatever remains. Okay, so what would the exponential function of the story problem look like? How would we, so what's our, what's our initial value? And it wants it Q of T. So the quantity after a set amount of time, what do we start with? 30. 30, so that is always our A value. And then what is happening every day? What is our growth factor going to be? It, um, what you need to work on on the Wednesday, unit five? We're in unit five. Yes, we're looking at unit five, task two right now. 
looking specifically at question number four within the growth or decay, growth versus decay task. So we have our initial value of 30, and it says that we uh, the fluid is decreasing by 12% each day. So what would we be using as our growth factor or our B value? So it decreases by 12% per day. Uh-huh. So are we doing the one minus 12% and then we end up with 0.88 remaining? Yes, yes. So our growth factor is always showing the percent remaining. This is why we, can, we always have a positive B value because it's the percent that we have left. So after we have taken 12% out of 100%, we have 88% of it left. So fantastic. Okay, so that option is option number two in what I'm looking at because we, we again, we never use a negative value in our B. It has to be the percent remaining. It's kind of just like those story problems where like, oh, you get a 20% discount, but you pay $50. How much was it originally? We don't care about the 20%. We care about the 80%, the amount remaining. Same scenario. Okay, so we have to figure out how much air freshener is going to remain in one week. What are we going to, how are we gonna figure out how much is left after a week? Um, uh, we multiply 30 with 0.818, so we have to look for the T. So we plug in seven for the T, you bet, okay? So if the if we now have 30 times 80 hundredths to the seventh power, where do I start in my calculations? Point 0.88 and the XY button. XY to the seventh Seven. power. Yep. So we have to evaluate our exponent first. So we get 30 times 0 0.4086755963699 And again, if we're looking at this in practical terms, I have less than 100%, I have a 40 only about 41% of the initial value remains after a week. So it's lost more than half of its quantity. All right, but let's know exactly as an amount how much this is. Okay. Um, I'm lost. Where did you get the seven from? It said how how much do we have left after a week? So that meant seven, seven days, seven days passed because generally time is going to be in days. Okay. Okay. So then when we multiply that by 30, we'll just take to the nearest two decimal places. What is our quantity after seven days? You have 12.26 remaining. Twelve point two six grams. Was it in grams? Yeah. Yeah. Grams would remain. You got it. All right. So pre. So what we've been dealing with is linear functions where we have some base to an exponential power equaling what we call the amount. Take our amount, we raise it to some power, and we get an answer out of it. This is an exponential function where we're, our focus is solving for some quantity. Well, we have the reverse or what we call the inverse of this, and this is called a logarithm. So a logarithm, so this is an exponential, exponential 
And then we have a logarithm. And logarithms focus on solving for the X. So we rewrite this by saying log. Okay, and this just indicates that what the equation that we're writing is the inverse, is the backward switching of X and Y values of an exponential function. And the base still stays there, but we kind of write it lower, like it's this subscript. Then we have it, the base B to the A or B of A equals X. So now a logarithm solves for X and it's saying, if I have this base and it equals this amount, what exponent got me there? So all you're doing. So to start with, we would just be rewriting exponents into logarithmic functions. So if I have two to the x equals 16, rewriting this as a log, I start at the base, I circle around, and these two numbers are going to be together. I just write them as log two of 16 equals, and then when I cross back around this equal sign, it equals the X, okay? These are expressing the same things, okay? This is just the, the rewriting of logarithms. Again, a logarithm is the inverse, the, the opposite of an exponential function. And it's literally just saying, whatever my X and Y values are in my exponent, get switched in my logarithm. So that if I had a table that showed, if I had a table of values, so if I have X and the function of X, okay? If I have a one here, I have a four here. If I have a two here, I have um, a 16 here, if I have a three, I'm going to have a, um, I'm just going to say 32. I don't know exactly. I'm just making up numbers. So this input for my exponential function or my exponential value, when I plug it in and solve, this is my result. Now, if we have the inverse of that, and we mark that by saying f and the um, f negative one of x. And in this case, remember, it's just the, the opposite, the reciprocal, the it's just, it's not even necessarily reciprocal in this case. This is just a notation to show that this is the inverse of another function. And in this, you are literally just switching the x and y values. What was a Y here? So the output here becomes the input here. And when I solve it, it creates this input. The output of this gets plugged in for the in input of this inverse function. And when I solve it, I get two as a result. When I plug in a 32, I get three as an output. So literally it's just the, the changing of X and Y values. And if it was on a graph, if I have my coordinate plane and I cut a perfect slope of one through my graph and I graphed this one and four, two and 16, three and 32, okay? This would have me curving up. If I then graphed its inverse, I would have four and one, 16 and two, 32 and three. It would be creating this mirror, well, pretend I drew it better. It would be creating a mirror image split perfectly. If they were cut in half, each side is a mirror image reflection of the other. Okay. And we have a way of proving whether two equations are inverse functions of one another. Okay. But we'll, we'll start by just looking at um, the homework. So the, the 5.3 homework. 
It just wants us to start by rewriting logarithms in exponential function form. Because for us, we cannot solve for x when it's in logarithmic form. We need to convert it to exponential function and then use the property of like basis to solve for our variable. So to start with, I have, I show a log two of 16 is four. And I need to rewrite this in exponential function. So the number, the first number that we see is always our base. So when we're converting it, we have base, not base, not there. Um, we would have a two. And then as we circle around, this is the number on it. So it's two to the fourth power equals, and then as we finally circle around, equals the 16. Okay. That's all we need to do. So, so in this case, it's saying two, it had A equals B. So what's A? It's going to be the four. What's B? It's going to be the 16. We have log five of 25 is two. That's saying if I have a base of five, I get 25 when my exponent is two. So to rewrite this, I just start here at the base, swoop around and grab the next number. So five to the two, and then it equals the third number. So five squared equals 25, yes. So in this case, so when we wrote it, this 25 is almost kind of like in that exponential place that five, instead of being five squared, now it's five. What was my X over here is now that Y value here is in that X place equaling what's normally the Y. So it's just that X and Y's are switching, okay? So if we think of this as X and this is Y, well, this is Y and this is X type of thing. Positions are switching, that's why they're inverses. Okay, so, so we have log b of a equals x, and we have b of x equals a. It's just the switching around. So if we have log 4 of 2 is 1 half, how would we rewrite that as an exponential function? What's my base? You got four. Four is the base. What is its exponent value going to be? One half. One half, and it equals? Equal to two. Yeah. OK, so we got that. So now it actually wants us to go ahead and, and uh, I'm looking at number three on the homework. If I have log seven of 49 equals X, I need to, I wanna solve for X. I cannot do that in this format. I need to convert it to an exponential function. What is this gonna be as an exponential function? What's my base? Uh, seven. Seven? Yeah. What, what's its exponent? Um, 49. 49. Uh, its exponent oh. is actually going to be x? Never mind. <laughs> That's OK. Um, so seven to some power equals 49. 49. So since we have a base of seven over here, I need a base of seven over here to be able to find out what X is. So if I divide seven out of seven or seven out of 49, I get seven, right? So now this is seven squared equals seven X. 
to the x. So that means x equals 2. So we convert to exponential function, use the property of like bases, and solve for our variable. Okay. If I have I have log four over two fifty six equaling M. I need to solve for M. How do I start? Uh, you start with the base of four. Base of four. We read it, write it as an exponential function. So four. Um, uh, um, yes, it go one over 256. You bet. Now we have just previously gone over what, what happens when you have a fraction. How do we not have to deal with a fraction? Multiple. But let's us flip a number. The negative. A negative on the exponent, you bet. So we can't do the, the previous things that we've done where we've cleared the fraction by multiplying everything by the lowest common denominator. We, we don't have that in exponential functions. We need to use negative exponents to be able to flip it. So now I have 4m equals 256 to the negative one power. Now, how do I solve for m? My bases don't look anything alike. But I need them to. So what should I start doing? I forget what it's called, but you want them to have the same base rate. Yeah, we need to, you know, factor it out to uh, factor it out by its by fours. We'll see if we can make it this if four to some power equals two fifty six. So when we divide four out, what do we get? Uh, four and sixty four. 64. And I divide 4 out of 64. 4 and 16. And I divide 4 out of 16. I get 4 and 4. So 4 to the 1, 2, 3, 4th power gets me 256. So 4m equals 4 to the negative 4 because. I got you. So because we had four to the fourth and there was a negative on that four, uh, so four times a negative one makes it a negative four. So now that we have that, we have M equals negative four. So the logarithms really are, just have us doing the exact same things we were doing in the exponential functions. We just need one more step and that is converting it from its log to exponent format. And then we do the same thing that we were already doing. Okay. Um, actually, let's look at, I'm going to look at number 10 real quick on that homework. All right. So if I have log two of five X plus three, equaling five. Okay. So first step. So the first step you find the base of two, number two. Yeah, so we just, our first step is always just rewrite it. Whatever's on the log is our base. Whatever is over on the equal side is our exponent on that base. And then it equals the argument, which is what this is called. So 
everything not the base or the exponent, the rest of it is what that equals. So I have 5x plus 3. Okay, so now in this case, x is not an exponent. It's a variable. So we can start treating this like normal. How would we start to solve for x in this equation? Is that we uh, supposed to be subtract three? Not yet, because we have a two to the fifth power. I can't take three away and move it to a side where I don't know how much this side is worth. So what do we need to do? Um, figure out two to the fifth power. Two to the fifth power. So two x to the y button and a five. I did that right. Two x to the y five. Okay. It's thirty two. Okay. Oh, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> 32 equals 5x plus 3. Yeah, now you start to subtract. Now we can subtract the 3 off of both sides. Yeah. 29 equals 5x. That the fraction it, it goes uh, 29 over 5. Yeah. 29 fifths. And I believe you can just type that in. You don't have to do anything beyond. Yep, you just type that in as a fraction. And that's what x is worth. There you go. Okay, so the inverses are just showing that, you know, the x of 1 is the, and its result then turns into the input of the other and its answer. Um, actually, I, I like my other pairing. Um, when we were looking at, if we were looking at a scenario where I have the function of eight, so it says if I plug in an eight into my equation and I get a seven for the answer, the inverse of that which we mark with a negative one on the F, the inverse of that becomes seven equals eight. So I plugged in an eight into this equation. I got a seven as a result. I took that seven, I plugged it in as the input of the second equation solved and got the eight as a result. So the output of the second equation is the input of the first equation. So it's literally just showing how the x and y's switch places in inverse functions. Okay, so if I have the function of negative one or the, or the inverse function of negative six is negative two, the function of negative two would be negative six. It's just this switching of roles. Okay, so now we want to look at seeing whether two equations are inverses of each other. When you're given two equations, they'll each have different names of their function. It doesn't mean anything other than just it's a way to differentiate one from the other. This is the F function. This is the G function. Frank and Gigi. I don't know. Okay. Um, and then in trying to find out if one is the inverse of the other, we plug one equation in for the variable of the second one. So the different ways that we can write um, composite function is saying it wants to know what the answer is to F based on the answer to G. So if we start solving, solve for X, you get a result. That result then gets plugged in here as the input of the F function. So if we follow this, we look at, we're starting at the G function. I don't have, because this just says an X, I don't have a number to plug in for X. So the re answer to X as an input is X plus four divided by three as an output. Okay, so this is my 
Input is X, my output is X plus four over three. Well, then the invert, then it wants me to then find out, okay, well, if that's the answer to this equation, this function, plug that value in for the input of my second function. So now that means uh, instead of having an X, I'm gonna have an X plus four over three as an input. So when I plug that in, I have three times X, which is X plus four over three minus four. Okay, so it wants to know what's the result when I plug this in for the value of X. So when I multiply a three by a fraction, I'm gonna go ahead and turn this three into a fraction as well. And this is really convenient because the threes cancel out. So that just leaves me with an X plus four. So I have an X plus four minus four. Well, when I combine my like terms, four and negative four cancels out. So the function of X plus four divided by three is X. Well, look at that. That's what we had here. This input became this output. This output became this input. So these are inverse functions and we know they're inverse functions when I plug one into the other and it simplifies to X. If there's any other value, they are not composite inverse functions, or I mean, they'd be composite functions, but they wouldn't be inverse functions, okay? We can also be asked to, so that would be the answer to this. We can also be asked to switch it around, find out what G is based on F's answer. So if I look at F, since it's the inside, it's where I start with first. I don't have the value for X, so its answer is 3X minus four. This is what the Y value is worth based on this being the X value. So that means this is what I plug in as my input in the second equation. So I have, um, I plug in three X minus four for X. So this is my Y. I get three X minus four plus four over three. Well, okay. I'm gonna, this parentheses really isn't necessary. So I'm gonna clean up the top here. I'm gonna combine like terms. I have a negative four and a positive four. Oh, well those cancel out, leaving me with a three X over three. Three divided by three is one. One X is just X. So if I had an input, of three X minus four, I get an output of X. Well, that was, that's the inverse, what was going on up here. So that means these two functions are inverses. So we're given another set of equations and we have to determine if they are inverses of one another. Good hint, if there's an exponent involved, they're not gonna be, because because exponents are making a number multiply by itself, which creates so such tremendous growth that it doesn't balance out, okay? But let's prove it. Let's prove what it is. And this is another way of noting what is the function of F based on G, okay? So it's saying we look, we focus on G's function first because it's closest to the X. Can I simplify this? Can I solve this? Do I have a value to plug in for X? No. So X equals, or X with this being X, Y equals this, okay? So this is my output to this equation. It's just, I can't, I put in an X, I get three X squared plus three X, as a result, I can't do anything else with it, not enough information. So then I take this output and I plug it in as the X value to my first equation. So I take it and I plug it in to the X so that I can find F's value. So if I have two times 
x, and x is 3x squared plus 3x plus 3, what does this turn into? Well, I distribute the 2 times the 3. 2 times 3 is going to be 6. We keep the x squared on it. 2 times a 3x is going to be a 6 with a singular x, and then I just have a 3 at the end. My, my, my numbers didn't cancel out. I'm not left with an x. I'm left with a 6x squared plus 6x plus 3. So guess what? Those are not inverses because I didn't get x as a result. I plugged in the answer for the other one as the input of the second one, but I didn't get x as a result, so not inverses. We can, but this is what you, it wants this value. This is what it's asking for. It wasn't asking you to determine if it was an inverse or not. Um, when you're asked in question number three, you're gonna, you know, when you solve for, when, when they all canceled out to an X, you put in for A, oh, the answer was X. For B, the answer was X. And thus G of X is called an inverse function of F of X. So you would type in the word inverse as the third uh, answer in the third answer box of question number three and number two. Okay, so let's look at number five here. Okay, I have f of x equals 4x plus 5, and g of x is 2x squared plus 5x plus 5x. So if it wants to know what the answer to f is based on the solution to g, what am I going to do? Wants me to solve the f function based on the g function's answer. We um, plug in the output. We plug in the output of G for the X. For the X in the F function. Very good. So where we have the X, I'm replacing it with what it said X is worth. And then adding five to it. So now to get rid of the parentheses, I have to distribute the four. Four times a two X squared is an eight X squared. Four times five X is 20 X. And then I just have a five. No terms can be combined because they all have different variable degrees or lack of a variable. And so this is the solution to your composite function. Hey, Katie, you're on mute. Thank you. All right, so the last thing for today is going to be looking at compound interest. Now there is a specific video just for this, so you don't have to go through this entire video to find this material, but let's just cover it now. So compound interest, this formula is only only used when you are dealing with money and interest rates and, and growth compounding, okay? Any other exponential growth or decay is our standard A, B to the X power format. So for money, we use the formula 
the amount that we have or that we have accrued in interest total is calculated by taking our principal investment, that's our starting amount, however much we invested or however much we borrowed if we took out a loan, and multiplying it by one plus the rate over the number of times we are being asked to pay this or have this calculated in a year. We then raise that to the um, n to the t power. So we multiply the number of times calculated in a year by the number of years this, this is going on. So if you were to invest $5,000, you invested, you wanna make some money, uh, you know, doing stocks or just, just whatever. You wanna make some money uh, investing in a bank to, to increase your, your savings. So, and you wanna figure out how much money you would make in say five years when interest is calculated on a monthly basis. So oftentimes if you've ever taken out a mortgage or a credit card or some sort of bill, you have interest that you have to pay and you have to pay that every month, you get a bill. And so that means that your the amount that you've borrowed or your interest is being calculated on a monthly basis for the whole year. So my loan amount or this, this money, my investment that I made, my savings, I put in $5,000. And I'm supposed to make an annual rate of growth of, let's go 7%, okay? So we keep our one because that's still accounting for that initial value. So we always have to have the one, this, this represents our B plus the rate of 7%, we convert it to its decimal equivalent. I cannot use a seven up here because that would be saying a 700% growth each time. Nope, it is a 7% growth. And if my interest is being calculated every month, how many months are in a year? Well, there are 12, okay? Then that means that it's being calculated 12 times over five years. So when you have your interest rate, oftentimes we call it an APR. So maybe, so what I'm saying is I have a 7% interest rate, but that isn't being applied each time it's calculated. That is being divvied up and distributed evenly amongst 12 months. So if I take, um, 0.7 or 0 0.07 and divide by 12, each month I have then each month has an interest accrual of 0 0.0583. So it's, sorry, that's not a zero, that's a decimal. So it's like less than, it's just over half of a percent. It's not even a whole percent. So it's not a lot. It's not a very good gain, um, but it does add up. Okay. So what, oh, I should have kept all of that. Okay. So based on the order of operations, we solve what's in parentheses first. Well, I have a division situation and an addition situation. I have to divide before I can add. So I go 0 0.07 divided by 12. And that gives me 0 0.00583333333 indefinitely, okay? So once I have that, I add it to one. So now I have 1.00583333333. You want to keep a lot of them because this does actually make a difference. Each one of those can contribute pennies worth to your, your amount or dimes or just, uh, it, can, it can make a difference in the answer. So you want to keep it really nice and long. You don't want to cut it off and shorten it. All right, then I got to figure out, well, what power is this being raised to? 12 to the fifth, or not 12 to the fifth, 12 times five. So that is saying in five years, 
the interest will be compounded 60 times, okay? So what this is leading to is letting me know, because I, if I have an initial investment of 5,000, and in one month, maybe I make uh, let me go 5,000 times, maybe I make 30 bucks off of that. Okay, so now at one month in, my balance is now at $5,030. Now I'm calculating interest on this. So then if I multiply uh, 50, 30 and say, just go for it. I, uh, ooh, no, that's not working quite right. Yeah, it's just a little bit different. So maybe now I have 5,061 dollars. So it wasn't a flat 30 because I made interest on the interest. So each time that this gets calculated, it's being calculated on my new amounts. And it would just take too darn long to, to calculate it by hand, but it's creating growth on growth because you're, you've made this interest, it adds to your balance, and then that gets interest calculated on it. So that's why it's compounding. It keeps expanding. All right. All right. Back to this. So I have my, where did I put my calculator? Here it is. Okay. So I have my long value here, and I need to find out what that is to the 60th power. So I go 1.00583333333. I just put a lot of them in. It eventually stops recognizing numbers, so I stop there. And then I hit the X to the Y button and type in 60. I now have 1.41762. Five two five nine six one three seven zero six. Again, because this is practical, this this is relating to a percentage. One is talking about the initial value. So the whatever is beyond that is actually what my total growth amount was. I increased my initial value by almost forty two percent. It's pretty decent for not touching a chunk of money for a couple of years. All right, but let's find out what exactly it is that I made. How much did I make off of my savings investment? So when I take that and I multiply it by my initial value, I get my amount is $7,088. And I'm going to, it said one, two, six. But because I need to round to the nearest penny, it's going to be one, two, or it's going to be one, and three, seven thousand dollars, seven thousand eighty-eight dollars and thirteen cents. So I made just over two thousand dollars in five years for not doing anything. That's kind of the nice thing about investing, uh, is you can make some money off of it. This is also where things can go terribly, terribly wrong if you happen to take out a loan, a mortgage, a credit card, and you don't have a nice little percent like this, usually credit card percents are more like 20, which as you can see how quickly things can grow with a little interest rate, how bleh, huge they can get with a larger one, because it might be 20, but you're paying one point something percent of this each month. That's what your your accrual of uh, interest would be. So if I had five thousand dollars out um, times point zero one six, just like if in a month I would at least have eighty dollars added to my bill. I think it's this is even too nice because I know I've had a credit card. I have like one hundred and eighty dollars just in interest, and my loan wasn't even that big. But and then the minimum payment was only like $75. Well, if I only paid the minimum, but they charged me maybe 150, that means my balance is only getting bigger and bigger and I'm wasting more and more money just on interest. So that's why overpaying is always a good thing and being aware of the uh, your, your interest rates, because they'll get you.